Okay, we can start. Welcome everybody, good to be with you today. It is the beginning of the end. We have been walking alongside Miss Sophie Amundsen since the end of September, the beginning of October. She's been learning all the same things we've been learning, and now we begin the first of two lessons to find out how her story ends. Um, you'll recall that Sophie's under, so the two things are going on with Sophie. It's not just the learning, it's also the mystery of, I never turned on food, but I'm teaching, like actually teaching right now and being later. filmed. Yes, later, definitely. Haley's my favorite. Um, She's also been getting these strange messages, remember, for this other girl named Hilda. Hilda's the same age as Sophie, has the same birthday as Sophie, but Sophie has no idea who she is. She's never met this Hilda, and yet Hilda's father is sending messages to his daughter, care of Sophie. And then it gets weirder than that. She starts finding Hilda's belongings around her house. She starts finding postcards. In the postcards of chapter 13, she sees postcards that Hilda's father sent from Lebanon to Norway, which is ex a distance of exactly very far, and they're postmarked the same day, and that's not possible. Sophie even dreams of Hilda. That's not odd. If you were getting strange messages, you'd probably dream about this person too. Um, so she's in, her, she's in the dream and she's trying to interact with Hilda and she reaches for her. Hilda can't see her. She reaches for her and Sophie grabs a hold of this gold crucifix that's around Hilda's, dream Hilda's neck. And Sophie wakes up and the crucifix is still with her in her hand. She pulls this crucifix, Freddy Krueger style, out of the dream. So something very weird has been going on and we're about to get to the bottom of what it is. One day, Sophie finds another postcard from Hilda's father, addressed to Hilda, and she goes and she takes it to Alberto. Since the last time we talked to Sophie, she started meeting Alberto in person in his apartment. Some people have pointed out that's even creepier than the letters. Nevertheless, that's what's going on. And when, when Sophie reads the postcard to Alberto, where Hilda's father compares himself to God, Alberto gets very angry. We've never seen a reaction like this from him. But all of a sudden, Alberto reacts with this hatred toward this mysterious father of Hilda. He gets ruder all the time. But maybe it's just as well, said Alberto. Why? I'll, I'll, it'll make it easier to unmask him. But this trick was both pompous and tasteless. It almost stinks of cheap perfume. Perfume? It tries to be elegant, but it's really a sham. Can't you see how he has the effrontery, the gall, the nerve to compare his own shabby surveillance of us with God's providence? Alberto holds up the card, rips it up, and says, no more worrying about Hilda and Hilda's father. Let's get back to learning. Alberto then, over the next several days, begins to teach Sophie about some of the early modern philosophers. And the very first one he introduces her to the very first one he introduces her to is René Descartes. He lives from 1596 to 1650. He's considered the first of the modern philosophers. We're going to spend a couple minutes with him, longer than we're going to spend with any of the other people in this sequence, because there are a couple of ideas from Descartes that we need to understand, because they're really important for forming the world that we're in right now. Descartes wants to build a firm foundation for what we can know. He's living on the other side of all these changes in society. The, the Middle Ages end, the Renaissance begins, there's the Reformations, there's all the Reformation, there's all the wars, there's all the killing and misery, people fighting over things that they believe to be true. You're not going to be able to get through, go sit down. They're fighting over things that they believe to be true but do not know to be true. Descartes wants to figure out what it is that we can actually know. So he says, the way to start is imagine that there is a demon. He's not saying there's really a demon. He's a thought experiment. Imagine that there is a demon. And this demon has made it so that you are hallucinating your whole lived experience. Leola Marie thinks she's eating sketty. 
She's not. She's hallucinating, Skeddy. It's not real. How would you prove that that's not the case? How would you prove that that Skeddy is real and not some demon implanted it in your mind? <laughs> By eating it, you say, but the demon has just implanted the sensation of, of taste and uh, sensation of a full stomach. No, see, there's no way, there's no way to prove it. So what can we know? If everything around us can be fake, can be untrue, what is left for us to say, I actually know this with some certainty? What if, what if, Haley, what if you don't exist? Can you even know that you? I feel like I, I don't know if you exist, but I feel like I know I exist. Ah, yes, Haley's on to something. So Descartes says, stupid am I, do this. Try to doubt whether you exist. Okay? Are you able to do it? For a second. You're able to doubt your own existence for a second. Then Descartes says, but wait a minute. When I doubt whether I exist, doubt is a form of thinking. So even while I'm doubting, I'm thinking. And if I'm thinking, well, in Latin, cogito ergo sum, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. The fact that I am a thinking being means that I can know with 100% certainty that I exist. I cannot know that Haley exists. I wish I didn't know that Amaya exists, but the only thing I can have 100% certainty on is the brute fact of my existence. I could be wrong about every detail. So what if I'm dreaming? What if it's a computer simulation? What if I'm a character in Ava's dream? What if I'm a brain in a vat on some mad, mad scientist's shelf with electrodes sticking out of it? In all of those cases, I still exist. I'm just wrong about what kind of existence I have. Even if I'm a figment of Caitlin's imagination, I'm still a figment of her imagination that exists. Everything else, though, is open to at least the potential of doubt. He then goes and reconstructs uh, our ability to know things with less than 100% certainty. Um, and he, he sort of cheats here, and that's not going to be the main, uh, our main focus. But if you look into how Descartes reconstructs reality, he leaps from philosophy to faith right at this point. And he says, well, God is good, and God wouldn't create a universe in which everything around us was, was unreal, and that we're just walking around deceived. That, that may well be the case. That may well be what someone believes. But it's kind of cheating in the argument that he was trying to build. The other important point about Descartes that we're spending a little more time with today than the other philosophers is how he defines what we are and the relationship between the world of matter and the world of spirit, or between the body and the soul. He looks at our physical bodies, and he says they're essentially machines, like a clock. You wind up a clock, and it works on its own power. Our bodies work on their own power. Inside our bodies is something else. And that's the soul, the ghost in the machine. He still believes in the soul. But he has radically overturned what the soul is. Because he has presented body and soul as two entirely separate, distinct things which have been combined artificially. So from Descartes' perspective, it would be perfectly possible for there to be a fully functioning living human being that happened not to have a soul, because a soul is added from the outside in Descartes' perspective. Two entirely different realms that don't mix at all. In the older ways of viewing these things, in Plato's vision, we know he thinks the soul is what's most important, and we know that he thinks this world of matter is just a shadow, but that still makes body and soul intimately connected and inseparable, at least in this world. 
Um, you'll, you'll see real well, but Amaya, are you casting a shadow? So, Amaya's casting a shadow, all right? For Plato, Amaya's the soul, the shadow is the physical. We already know this. But now, Amaya, without changing your position in the light, stop casting that shadow. You can't do it. No. The, the, the matter and the shadow are intimately connected. If Amaya's shadow were to say, I am so tired of following Amaya around all the time. She sucks so much. Is your shadow going to be able to break off and come follow Sally because Sally's better than you? No. It would like to, but it can't because for Plato, matter and soul are still intimately united as a single whole. Aristotle's vision is different. For Aristotle, the soul is the form of the body. So we don't have a soul in us. We're surrounded by soul. But neither matter nor form for Aristotle can exist without each other. Remember, those are the ingredients of being. So they are intimately united as one thing, cannot be separated without destroying both. For Descartes, my soul has more in common with my glasses than the way Plato or Aristotle described it. My glasses are not a part of me. They're added to me from the outside. They weren't with me when I was born. That would have been a story for my mom to tell. They weren't with me when I was born. I got them when I was seven. I put them on and they give me certain powers that I otherwise wouldn't have. I cannot see any of you. Well, that's better. I cannot, I cannot see any of you. And now I have, have the power to see all of you, but they're not me. Descartes has completely divided the realm of the physical from the realm of the spiritual. A major benefit to that now is that from Descartes forward, when we want to deal with, explain, manipulate, control physical things, we no longer distract ourselves with spiritual questions. If I'm having chest pains and I go to the doctor, the doctor is unlikely to give any thought to whether someone has put a curse on me, unlikely to give any thought to whether I have been possessed by demons. Perhaps both of those things are possible, but that's not where my doctor's attention is going. Because if my doctor started there, I'd be dead before he ever actually looked at the machine, the pump that is my heart. That's the positive of Descartes. The negative, the potential negative, at least in the way we experience reality, it sort of rips some of the magic and some of the meaning out of reality. If, if indeed we are but machines that we could very well live without this spooky other layer, Within a generation, Descartes, a, Descartes a, a religious person, within a generation, people are going to start asking, well, if I can do without it, then why don't we just do without it? Um, some will experience that as a negative consequence. Some will experience that as liberating. If we do without the spooky magic stuff, we're not burning anyone alive over it either. So I'll leave it to you to judge whether that's a positive or a negative. What is undeniable and has a huge impact on the way our world has developed since then. Alberto then teaches Sophie about Baruch Spinoza, who lived from 1632 to 1677. We're just going to spend a quick moment on each of these other philosophers now that we've introduced Descartes. Spinoza looks at God and Spinoza looks at nature and he says they are one and the same thing. Whereas Descartes had divided body and soul, Spinoza completely unites them, so much so that there's now no longer any distinction. According to Spinoza, if you want to know what God wants of you, or if you want to serve God, or if you want to connect with the, your higher power, the ultimate reality, don't look to anything supernatural, because there is nothing supernatural, because God and nature are one. That will have a major impact on how the sciences develop. John Locke, you all spent time with him in civics class, didn't you? Yes. John Locke? Yeah, really. 
Vinny, you know way you were paying attention in civics class. I knew you was a ninth grader. You tell me you were paying attention in class in eighth grade? I pay attention now. Um, Locke is an empiricist, so he believes that the only knowledge we have access to is that which comes from our senses. That we're born empty, a blank slate, tabula rasa in Latin. And that all we have in our mind when we're born are structures, like, like these. So this might, be, this might be my mind now. This might be Solly's mind right now. But this is my mind when I'm born. It's empty, and this is Amaya's mind right now. It's, it's empty except for blank pages. It's empty, but it has the structures that will allow me to organize the knowledge that I add to it. Um, some of that knowledge from my senses is objective. I can be sure of it. So, feel that. You and me, we're going to count the other people in this row, not, in cloud, not including you. Count. One, two, three, four. What'd you come up with? She came up with four, I came up with four. We used our senses, the sense of sight, to determine there were four people. We're in agreement. The quantity of people in this row is an objective fact. Now, Mary, what color hair does Francine have? Who is Francine? Francine, raise your hand. Um, dark brown with light, light brown highlights. Dark brown with light, light brown highlights. I see the same thing. I would have said more reddish, but I see the same thing. Now, but what I can't possibly know is when Mary experiences the sight of dark brownness, and I experience the sight of dark brownness, whether our inner experience is the same or even close. It could be that when I experience brown, I'm experiencing what Mary experiences when I experience green. Or maybe Mary's experiencing something I couldn't even conceive of. It's a subjective reality. A lot of what we think we know is really subjective, where there is no way to come to consensus on an exact answer to it. What we need then is as many perspectives as possible, as many voices in the conversation as possible. You met John Locke when he was talking about politics. It shouldn't surprise you, though, that one of the most important philosophers behind our concept of democracy is someone who also believes that all knowledge depends on having as many voices in the conversation as many perspectives as possible. Locke didn't just wake up one day and say, what do I think government should be like? Locke began as a philosopher of mind, exploring these big questions of knowledge, and then he applied it to the realm of politics. He also applied what he had inherited from Francisco de Vitoria, the inventor of universal human rights. And what we're most familiar with, probably, is the way Locke explains what those rights are. Life, liberty, property, which we'll eventually adapt into life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That's John Locke. Alberto then introduces Sophie to David Hume. I feel like in the interest of time, he's very interesting, he's very important, but not interesting or important enough to burn up today's time. You can read the Hume chapter in Sophie's world. Um, the last philosopher in this sequence is George Barclay. It looks like Berkeley. It was Barclay. Why did they do that, Maya? Why would they spell it that way? If you want stupid, stupid names. Yeah. yeah. Um, Berkeley. Berkeley says that this whole, this whole experience we have of being alive in this world, it's not real. You think you're sitting on a chair right now, Caitlin? How do you know? Because you can feel the chair underneath you, right? Yeah. Barclay says, Sick. All of our sense experiences, yeah, that's all we can know. But none of it's real. Because there is no physical universe. There is nothing but God and the mind of God. We're not these beings of flesh and blood. It's ju that's just an interface that helps us make sense of our experience. We are thoughts in the mind of God. 
There are people who make arguments like this to this day. They shift some of the details. Barclay's a bishop in the Church of England, so he's going to he's going to express his God language in a very Christian way. Um, those who argue that we're walking around in a computer simulation, they might not be talking about the mind of God, but they're painting essentially the same picture. And there's a scientist who's been really popular over the last five or six years. His name is Donald Hoffman. He doesn't overtly use God language, but he's arguing that what's most real, the basic level of reality, isn't matter, it's thought that it's, there's consciousness that runs through everything, and the basic level of reality is mind. And three-dimensional space-time that we live in, where I can, I can smell things, I can see things, I can touch things, all of that is, it's like, here's an example he uses, I wouldn't plan on doing this, but right, it's like, if I can never get to my stupid desk out, it's like, Ooh. All right. So it's like it's like the desktop menu on your computer. Okay. So here is here's VLC media player. So we play movies and stuff like that. Well, it's an orange cone. Is is this program an orange cone? No. Is this really the program? This picture? No. <clears throat> the program is this abstract collection of ones and zeros stored on the inner circuitry that I'm not, I'm, I'm even, even the little I've said is already embarrassing because I know so little about computers. But if I had to deal with this program as it actually is, and I had to dive into the ones and the zeros and the circuitry and stuff, you know, to watch a movie, I'm never watching that movie, all right? I'm not, I, at my level of experience, this is close enough to what's real to get me what I want to do. Donald Hoffman will say, uh, three-dimensional world of senses and solid things. Um, it's, it's not designed, to, it's not what's real. It's just we experience that because it helps us survive and reproduce. Now we've gotten ahead of ourselves because Donald Hoffman is alive today and Alberta was talking about people in the 1700s. At any rate, it was a lot for Sophie to take in. Right? What we've just covered in 20 minutes or so uh, took Sophie several days. The last thing Alberto introduces her to before we move back on to Sophie herself is the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is this beautiful moment where this isn't true. History's almost always written in blood. How many of the stories we've told in here about the big movers and shakers of our world have been about people really good at cutting off heads, about mass killing, burning people alive, blood, blood, blood. The real pages of a history book are read. This is the exception. This is the one time where history was changed, history was written, history was moved by nerds like me. Nerds who study philosophy, and sit around and drink coffee and wear pantyhose, which I do not, that's not like me Whoa. in that regard, and Whoa. talk about big ideas in the coffee shops, the salons of Paris. And essentially what they're trying to do, what the Enlightenment thinkers are trying to do, one, is recreate society so that everything we do in society is based on logic and reason that, hey, wait a minute, why are you lighting that guy on fire? Well, we've always lit people like this on fire. What well, we've always done this is not a good enough reason. Uh, it's our tradition, it's what's been handed on to us. It's not a good enough reason. They want to reorient society around logic. The ultimate goal is freedom and happiness. That's been a unifying theme all year in this class. On like day two, we heard from Aristotle that the whole aim and end of human existence is happiness. On lesson seven, we talked about the real meaning of freedom, how being free is being able to do those things which will make me the best version of myself, the freedom for excellence. 
the Enlightenment gamble was that the best path to this, to happiness and freedom, is through logic and reason. Um, it's a gamble that paid off. It paid off scientifically. It paid off in an explosion of education. It paid off in, when you see liberalism here, don't have a heart attack. We're not talking about the politics of today. Uh, we're talking about a whole approach to society and the, the liberal approach to society, the classical liberal approach to society is an approach where everyone's rights are respected and everyone has a say. Basically, uh, like in U U.S., on the political spectrum in U.S., everybody's a liberal in that sense. It's just that conservatives are slightly less liberal and the ones we call liberals are slightly more liberal, that's all. They're the principles behind the foundation of our republic. A republic founded by the, the grandchildren of those who died in those miserable wars of reformation. I think culminating ultimately in the First Amendment of our Constitution is where you see enlightenment ideals brought to light. The enlightenment became flesh and dwelt among us at this moment where we enshrine freedom of religion, free speech, freedom of the press, right to hang out, right to peaceably assemble, and a recognition that when the government's not protecting these rights, we're able to uh, oppose that government. It was contagious. So the beginning of the 19th century saw, saw political liberalism, liberal democracy spread, first with the independent movement in Haiti, then with the independence movement in Colombia, and on and on and on, but I've gone on and on and on. Let's find out what Sophie's up to now. Now that Sophie's learned all this too, now that Sophie's learned all this too, she finds herself one day back at Alberto's apartment, and Alberto's showing her something on the computer. Keep in mind this is 1990, right? So this computer is not connected to the internet. He's got a program. The program's on a little computer disk. It's like Google with only the tiniest fraction of the power, because it's only searching information that's on that disk. Sophie's looking up a couple things on the disc, and who should appear on the screen but Hilda's father. He introduces himself. His name's Albert Nod. Mm. That's a hmm. Yeah, Barb, why are you saying hmm? Because Alberto Knox is Alberto Knox. It sounds very similar to Alberto Knox. Yeah, yeah. The teacher's Alberto Knox, and Hilda's father reveals himself as Albert Nog. He's talking to her through the computer screen, which isn't possible in 1990, or at least not with the technology they have. And Alberto, the teacher, loses it. He gets furious again, this strange, guttural hatred that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Alberto has for this man. So he goes into the computer. Yeah, I'm so stupid. He goes into the computer. <laughs> he goes into the computer and he deletes Albert Nog, he deletes Hilda's father from the computer. So now he can get on talking to Sophie and they can keep learning free of whatever this guy is and why ever Alberto hates him. It's been a stressful day. We've learned a lot today, right? From, from Descartes all the way through the Enlightenment and then to have this happen. So Sophie's like, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. She needs to get a bite to eat before she gets back to the knowledge. So she grabs herself a banana and she, Unpeels banana and and the mouse doesn't work. And here I am again, Hilde, written on the inside of the banana peel, <laughs> written on the inside of the banana peel by Albert Nog. The guy will not leave her alone. Yes, that ever happened to you? Yeah, sometimes. No, it didn't. Oh, no one's ever writing to you. No one's writing to you. No one's coming. Yeah, oh, that happens. I can see that. I can see that. Hey, quit dropping that bottle. Yeah, I know. Let's open to page 255 in Sophie's world. 255. So, obviously Sophie's weirded out. She goes home and she can't wait to hear from Alberto once he's figured out what's going on. Because freaky stuff is going on. And instead of reaching out to her the next day to make sure she's okay, Alberto ghosts her for two weeks. Two weeks go by. She hasn't heard from anybody. 
And now it is June 14th. It's the day before both Sophie and Hilda's birthday. Um, we're on 255, about two thirds of the way through the page. Exactly two weeks went by without Sophie hearing a word from Alberto. She got another birthday card for Hilda, but although the actual day was approaching, she did not receive a single birthday card herself. One afternoon, she went to the old town and knocked on Alberto's door. He was out, but there was a short note attached to his door. It said, happy birthday, Hilda. Now the great turning point is at hand. The moment of truth, little one. <clears throat> Every time I think about it, I can't stop laughing. It has naturally something to do with Barclay, so hold on to your hat. Sophie tore the note off the door and stuffed it into Alberto's mailbox as she went out. Damn, surely he's now come back to Athens. How could he leave her with so many questions unasked? We're going to jump down just a little bit in the page. She's frustrated. She goes and grabs Hermes. Who's Hermes? No. The dog. Hermes is the dog. When they had, when, she, when Sophie and Hermes had crossed Main Square and were making for the old town, they passed by a park with a playground. Hermes stopped by a bench as if he wanted Sophie to sit down. She did. And while she patted the dog's head, she looked into his eyes. Suddenly, the dog started to shudder violently. He's going to bark now, thought Sophie. Then his jaws began to vibrate, but Hermes neither growled nor barked. He opened his mouth and said, Happy birthday, Hildy. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sophie was speechless. Did the dog just talk to her? Impossible. She must have imagined it because she was thinking of Hilda. But deep down, she was nevertheless convinced that Hermes had spoken in a deep, resonant bass voice. The next second, everything was as before. Hermes gave a couple of demonstrative barks. Leona, bark. No. Bark. No. As if to cover up the fact that he had just spoken with a human voice and trotted on ahead toward Alberto's place. As they were going inside, Sophie looked up at the sky. It had been fine weather all day, but now heavy clouds were beginning to gather in the distance. Alberto opened the door and Sophie said at once, no civilities, please. You are a great idiot and you know it. Oh, you should be Alberto then. Oh, hold on, I don't even know where we are. <laughs> Wait, what's the matter now? The major, that's Albert, Albert now, the major taught Hermes to talk. Ah, uh, so it has come to that. Yes, imagine. And what did he say? I'll give you three guesses. I imagine he said something along the lines of happy birthday. Bingo! Let's, <laughs> let's now, um, we're going to jump, we're going to jump to page 280. What? Okay! <clears throat> we're at the, we're at the very last line, we're at the very last line on page 280. And it's Alberto speaking here. So to be or not to be is not the whole question. The question is also who we are. Are we really human beings of flesh and blood? Does our world consist of real things? Or are we encircled by the mind? Sophie continued to bite her nails. Alberto went on. Material reality was not the only thing Barclay was questioning. He was also questioning whether time and space at any absolute or independent existence. Our own perception of time and space could also be merely figments of the mind. A week or two for us need not be a week or two for God. Here, be Sophie. You said that for Berkeley, the spirit that everyone exists, or that everything exists is in its, <laughs> wait, in is the Christian God. Yes, I suppose I did, but for us. Us? For us, you and me. This will or spirit that is the cause. Uh, I just lost my thought the most important part. Right. For us, for you and me, this will or spirit that is the cause of everything in everything could be Hilda's father. Sophie's eyes opened wide with incredulity. Yet at the same time, a realization began to dawn on her. Is that what you think? I cannot see any other possibility. That is perhaps the only feasible explanation for everything that has happened to us. All those postcards and signs that have turned up here and there, Hermes beginning to talk, my own involuntary slips of the tongue, by that he means he's been, he's been calling Sophie Hilda. I. Imagine my calling you Sophie, Hilda. I knew all the time that your name wasn't Sophie. What are you saying? Now you are definitely confused. 
Yes, my mind is going round and round, my child, like a giddy planet round a burning sun. And that sun is Hilda's father? You could say so. Are you saying he's been a kind of god for us? To be perfectly candid, yes. He should be ashamed of himself. What about Hilda herself? She's an angel, Sophie. An angel? Hilda is the one this spirit turns to. Are you saying that Albert Nog tells Hilda about us? Or, or writes about us. Um, for we cannot perceive the matter itself that our reality is made of. That much we have learned. We cannot know whether our external reality is made of sound waves or of paper and writing. According to Barclay, all that we can know is we are spirit. And Hilda is an angel. Hilda is an angel, yes. Let that be the last word. Happy birthday, Hilda. Suddenly, the room filled with a bluish light. A few seconds later, they heard the crash of thunder and the whole house shook. I have to go, said Sophie. She got up and ran to the front door. As she let herself out, Hermes woke up from his nap in the hallway. She thought she heard him say, See you later, Hilda. <laughs> Sophie rushed down the stairs and ran into the street. It was deserted, and the rain came down now in torrents. One or two cars were plowing through the downpour, or, but there were no buses in sight. Sophie ran across Main Street and on through the town. As she ran on, one thought kept going round and round in her mind. Tomorrow is my birthday. Isn't it extra bitter to realize that life is only a dream on the day before your 15th birthday? It's like dreaming you won a million, and then just as you're getting the money, you wake up. Sophie ran across the squelching playing field. Minutes later, she saw someone come running toward her. It was her mother. The sky was pierced again and again by angry darts of lightning. When they reached each other, Sophie's mother put her arm around her. What's happening to us, little one? I don't know. It's like oh, 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 yes. Hey, sorry. We gotta back up. Oh. We gotta, Carly, Carly, let's get up here. Get, no. up, get up here. 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 <laughs> Sophie's mom. Yeah, we want to give you. So I'll, um, one I'll, I'll back up. I'll back up. My, stand up. So I'm gonna go back to Sophie Rand. All right. Sophie ran across the squelching playing field. Minutes later, she saw someone come running toward her. It was her mother. The sky was pierced again and again by angry darts of lightning. Ah! When they reached each other, Sophie's mother put her arm around her. What's happening to this little one? I don't know. Sophie sobbed. It's like a bad dream. <laughs> I've... I should get an Oscar, like for real. I knew it doesn't. So I've, um, I titled this lesson which we're only halfway through, we'll finish it tomorrow, but I've titled the lesson, The Strange Death of Sophie Amundsen. Well, Sophie hasn't died the way you and I will die if our perception of reality is real. Something far more soul-shattering has just happened to Sophie. Sophie didn't die. She learned that she was never alive. Sophie and Alberto are characters in a book that Albert Nod is writing for her da his daughter, Hilda. They are not real. Like, uh, like a figment of one of your dreams becoming aware. So Leola, you have a dream about Maria and Dream Maria realizes Dream Maria realizes that she is just a character in your dream. She has all the hopes, all the thoughts, all the dreams of her own, and yet she only exists in here. And now, Maria, what are you terrified of? If you're a character in her dream. Hmm? That you're, you're not real, and what's the most frightening thing in the world to you? What, what's, what do you not want to have happen but is going to happen yeah. soon? Exactly. Well, if you're a character in a dream, in a dream she, wakes up. she wakes up. When Leola wakes up, you cease to exist if you are a character in, her, in a dream. When Alberto Nog finishes the book, Sophie is done for. And that's where we'll pick up tomorrow. Shai, you want to take a selfie show who they're working with?